Hello and welcome. Today, we present a progress report and the main monthly news from various simulation projects, both for PC and Android. Since today's video is going to be a bit longer, please give it a like to help with its promotion. If you don't like it by the end, you can always remove it. And if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing to receive weekly updates and special monthly videos like this one. Starting with PCSX2, which received two major updates this past month. Firstly, over 120 games have been fixed, addressing a ghosting effect caused by increasing the game's resolution, resulting in a more satisfactory image. This list of improved games may still grow, as many titles have yet to be tested by the community. Additionally, there was an enhancement allowing the emulator to utilize up to 128 megabytes of RAM, compared to the system's native 32 megabytes, providing extra performance for a small list of games, mainly homebrews. The project also removed the resolution scaling limit, now determined by the maximum texture resolution your GPU can support. RPCS3, which recently celebrated its 13th anniversary, now has over 70% of the console's library considered playable on its compatibility list. They are very honest with their list, classifying games as in-game if they have high system requirements, even if they can be played from start to finish. Recently, the emulator received an improvement focused on quad-core processors, doubling performance in games like Demon's Souls. If you have a quad-core processor with AVX2 support and had previous issues running the emulator, now might be the time to give it another shot. Moreover, there has been a significant improvement in the accuracy of games using Insomniac's engine, such as the Ratchet Clank series. While issues like the absence of grass have been fixed, the games remain unstable, causing crashes after some time of gameplay. Now let's talk about Dolphin, considered one of the best emulators of all time, capable of perfectly emulating the Nintendo GameCube and Nintendo Wii consoles. Incredibly, it can run more than 97% of the library of both systems. Recently, Dolphin posted a massive change log on their forum, but I'll bring you the main highlights. Custom Aspect Ratio a new custom aspect ratio feature has been implemented. Now, if you use screens outside the normal aspect ratio, like ultra-wide screens, you can simply select the desired aspect ratio. The emulator will adapt without needing to compensate for subtle proportion issues. Keep in mind that this feature is still not fully implemented and may present minor issues. Improved infrared method. For those using the Wii Remote directly on the emulator, there has been a significant improvement. Although using a controller like the DualShock 4 allows the gyroscope to work for pointing directions, there may be inaccuracies, and it might be necessary to reset the cursor location by pressing a button on the controller. I used the DualShock 4 to finish Super Mario Galaxy without issues, but improvements and real hardware support are always welcome. Auto HDR. A feature I really like is Auto HDR. Although Wii and GameCube games don't take much advantage of this feature due to the limited color gamut, it has been improved. Windows and Steam Deck users can already use this feature, but it is currently unavailable on Android. For those who want to enable the feature, I'll leave the ideal configuration for your screen on the video. Pause the video and select. Dolphin on iOS App Store. Many ask when Dolphin will be available on the iOS App Store. The answer is that, for now, this will not be possible. Dolphin uses a just-in-time, JIT, recompiler to translate code into something our modern CPUs can understand. The problem is that Apple does not allow third-party apps to use JIT recompilers on iOS and iPadOS. Dolphin has the interpreter and cached interpreter, which are non-JIT methods to emulate the CPU. However, they are much slower than Dolphin's JITs, making them unusable for real games. Lastly, Dolphin will no longer receive updates in the way we are used to. For those who use only the stable versions, the last stable version of Dolphin was 5.0, released on June 24, 2016. If you are still using this version, stop now, as you are missing all the progress of the last 8 years. Dolphin is adopting the rolling release cycle method, removing the stable version method. Updating the project now will bring versions later than 2407. Therefore, if you are using the last stable version, I recommend updating immediately to receive all these years of improvements. Always prefer development versions for any project in which you are running your games. Now let's talk about a rather strange piece of news. The new Nintendo Switch emulator called Xiaox has recently been involved in controversy. The developer stated in a Telegram chat that they had only ported Sadachi and inserted a virus. It appears the project has been discontinued, but there's something very odd behind all this. In a statement, the developer declared that the project has officially been discontinued and there will be no future updates. 
The reason, according to them, is that the GitHub repository received a DMCA notice from Nintendo due to a PayPal link allowing direct donations to the project. As a result, the repository has been made private. They also mentioned the challenges of maintaining such a project, fearing legal action from Nintendo, and admitted it was a foolish decision to leave the donation link. Upon analyzing the context, the strangeness lies in the fact that if the repository had indeed been banned, it would have been completely removed from GitHub, not just made private as mentioned. Before the repositories disappeared, it was still possible to access the releases page, where version 7 was available. This version promised better support for Mali and Snapdragon GPUs, along with other performance improvements. In my previous video, I did not test this project, and until it proves to be completely safe, I cannot recommend it. Remember, your phone is where you store a large part of your digital life, such as banking apps, email, and messages. Therefore, using this emulator is at your own risk. Earlier this month, Torzu emerged as an emulator supposedly developed on the deep web to evade Nintendo lawsuits. However, it has been virtually discontinued. Updates have become private and are now provided only on the developer's blog. Initially developed by a single person, the project saw significant improvements, but community pressure led the developer to halt public development. In a note, they stated the project was intended as a hobby, but in its early stages, it was bombarded with various correction requests, leading them to decide they couldn't dedicate time to it. Torza's last version was available on GitHub on May 31st. Now let's talk about Strato, a Nintendo Switch emulator for Android that has generated high expectations. Strato stands out for being specifically developed for Android, unlike other emulators like Yuzu, which are ported from Windows versions. Last week, there were numerous rumors about Strato's imminent release, and even the lead programmer confirmed that the launch was close. However, days passed without the launch happening. Some developers involved with the project mentioned that if Strato were released prematurely, it would be much inferior to Yuzu and could quickly be forgotten. This has caused some frustration in the community. Personally, I've almost forgotten about the project due to the lack of updates. However, it's important to remember that developers are working voluntarily to benefit the community, often receiving only hate in return. For now, I recommend not getting too excited about Strato until we have more concrete information. Anyone following the emulator scene for Switch may have heard about Nozomi. This project aimed to be a clean and legal Nintendo Switch emulator without using automatically generated key codes or illegally obtained code used in Yuzu's development. However, despite my report on Nozomi nearly a month ago, the last code update was exactly three weeks ago. Currently, the project doesn't run any commercial games or even homebrews. Therefore, don't expect much from this project for now. It's possible it may never see the light of day. Finally, let's talk about Nyushu, a new fork of Yuzu that has just been released. Nyushu's major feature is the ability to reduce resolution by 50% and even 25% making it potentially more suitable for less powerful Android devices. Nyushu is being distributed directly through a Telegram community, with no development on GitHub or any other public platform. There are no significant performance gains compared to Yuzu, except for the internal resolution reduction, which can benefit devices with MediaTek processors. Several videos online show Nyushu running well on these processors. If you're curious to try this project, it's available now, but I recommend caution due to its limited development and distribution solely through Telegram. Now let's talk about PlayStation 4 emulation. So far, I've only made one video about this system, focusing on FPPS 4. It was quite challenging, and honestly, I found the project to be quite weak, difficult to install games and with poor performance, even in 2D games. I'll leave the video link in case you want to check it out. Today, however, let's discuss Shad PS4, an emulator developed by the same creator as PCSX2. Over the past two weeks, Shad PS4 has received many improvements. Among the updates, a shader recompiler has been added, allowing many 2D and 3D games to start. Additionally, there has been a major rewrite of the emulation core. I'll provide some images and a video of One Piece running decently. We don't have the complete system requirements yet, but so far, about 10 games are playable. This is definitely a project I'll be following closely and will bring more updates soon. For those interested in frame generation, we've had a significant improvement in our lossless scaling algorithm. It now allows AI to interpolate two frames for each real frame, potentially boosting performance by up to 3x, provided you can maintain at least a constant 30 FPS in a game. To achieve this improvement, simply use the latest version of the program. 
I covered this news firsthand, as you can see in the video on the card. Additionally, I've made a comprehensive video showing how to correctly set up and use lossless scaling, explaining all its functions. And that's it for today folks, those are all the updates I had to share. Thank you for watching, and see you in the next video.